Uh, um, so how much is that? So. All right. Welcome to the podcast editor's mastermind. If you're joining us live, we'd love to know who's there. So maybe just hit us up with a comment in the chat and just let us know if you're listening live or maybe if you caught the replay so we can know that. If you follow the show in Apple Podcasts or whatever app of choice that you use, us old schoolers still call it subscribing, uh, You know, just stop by the episode notes and leave a comment and let us know that you're checking out the show because we'd love to hear from you. Now, this week, we're going to be talking about continuing education and why it's important, how we can accomplish it, all of those kinds of things specific for podcast editors and producers. Before we do that, really quick introductions. I'm Brian Ensman. You can find me at toptieraudio.com. Below me. I'm Daniel Abendroth. You can find me at rothmedia.audio. I'm Carrie Caulfield. Eric, you can find me at yayapodcasting.com. And our guest today is Heather Wester. She's actually been with us before. You can find her at Ironed Out Media. I'll give a little bit of an introduction in case you don't remember her. She uh, is a podcast editor and consultant. She works on shows such as the Teaching Artist Podcast and the Self Leadership Club. And you can find her at ironedoutmedia.com or at Ironed Out Media on Instagram. So Heather, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, guys. Glad to be here. Oh, it's great to have you. And I was really interested when I saw this topic that you that you brought up, because I think it's something that I try and stay on top of, but I don't know that I do very well. And so we're going to be talking about basically getting better, like keeping abreast of all of the things, and there are millions of things, and then just sort of that ongoing continuing education. Now, Heather, you had a really interesting perspective on like why this came to you. So can you maybe share what was going on in your mind when you said, hey, let's talk about this? Well, it had to do with me and my continuing education credits uh, because I'm in the medical field. That's my full-time job. I'm an EMT on an ambulance. And this past March, I was struggling to reach all of my education hours just because I'd been working so much during the pandemic. I didn't have time to actually focus on education, relearning those those protocols and just things that had changed and just having to brush up on those things. And whenever... The you all reached out for guests. That's just something that came to mind. You know, I love podcasting and, and editing as much as I love my other job. But I also, without even realizing, I, I do a lot of education, so to say, with editing. It, it's never ending. There's something that's always changing, evolving. And I, ju- I guess that just goes hand in hand with the way technology is. Yeah, I, I would definitely think that you're Right. In that. And I know that for me, there's a, there is a struggle with continuing education because like you, I do work a full-time job and I also edit several shows on the side. And so making sure that I set that time aside is difficult. Now, Daniel and Carrie, you guys are both full-timers. What, what's your perspective on continuing education? For me, it's like, so like, yes, I'm full-time doing this, but it's also like I do have a full workload. So trying to balance like all that while giving myself enough free time, I find it kind of difficult to kind of stay up with it all. I, so I'm a big believer in education. So I do try to make time regularly to learn new things. It, it is incredibly difficult. And sometimes I will have a client ask me something, you know, can we do this? And I might not necessarily know how to do it, but I use that as an opportunity to like learn. Like now is the perfect time to learn and I yeah. can charge for it. So <laughs> Right. Someone said to me, um, wow, Heather, you're a real whiz at Excel. How did you learn all that? Well, I'm only good at it because of how many problems I've encountered and just trying to do things easier and faster. And what do you do? Like Carrie said, you look it up. You take that opportunity to learn. And that in itself is education. But like you, Carrie, I don't set aside time for for learning. I, I try to find the time in my downtime between calls and, you know, on the ambulance and then here when I'm when I'm editing, you know, oh, how can I fix this? This is taking too long. And then I look it up during my editing process. I don't I don't charge by the hour, so it's okay. So I, I take that opportunity to look something up then. How about you, Daniel? <laughs> so one thing that helps me like be a better editor and learn my dog more is I have a YouTube channel dedicated to my dog and podcast editing. 
So when coming up with like topic ideas or just things come up, like I'm kind of forced to do research, kind of figure out how to solve these issues that other people might pop up or ideas I have Mm -hmm. um, in order to create content. But I would also, oh, can I do something? So I I have spent quite a bit on education and I think that like that financial commitment forces you. So I wanted to learn, mm. you know, when I did the fellowship, I wanted to learn what's the next level of podcasting. And that's exactly what I did. And I really did make sure I had time for it, right? Because I wanted to give it everything I had. Now, mm-hmm. you know, that was in theory, in practice, things happen. But because I, you know, had made that investment of my money, I was you know, I showed up as much as possible. I did as Mm -hmm. much as possible with it. And I think that that's one thing, you know, while I'm all for like, you know, you know, free information, there's nothing like paying for it to like make you step up Mm -hmm. and actually carve out the time and actually, you know, do the do the work a lot of people prefer to pay to pay for a class to pay for courses because they know that's going to be something that's going to force them to learn and and progress themselves so i like that you said that that was one of the things with me with podcast engineering school when i went through that several years ago i paid for the course and so like before i paid for the course i sat down with my calendar and said okay this is an x number of weeks course i think i can skate by and like do the bare minimum to get to on everything else, right? I can skate by and do the bare minimum on everything else for this length of time. And that gets me pretty darn close to the end of the course before I before the wheels <laughs> fall off and I've got to kind of reprioritize, <laughs> right? Because right? you, you can only deprioritize right. other things for so long before the wheels fall off. Uh, and I think that's mm-hmm. a, a big part of it. And I was really surprised to find out later that most of the people that were going through the course at the time that I did, didn't do the homework. And I'm like, guys, this course was not free. Like <laughs> the, the instruction's good. Like, don't get me wrong. The instruction's good, but the magic's yeah. in the practice. <laughs> And so right helps you apply it. right and that's like for my day job they have a they have a framework they say 70% you should learn by doing stuff on the job uh 20% is going to learning or learning from other people and then 10% is learning events like paid for training or that kind of thing and i try to you know this was like my that was my 10% but i'm like but the actual learning happens in that other 70 to 90%. And I think, Mm -hmm. you know, the way I approach it now is not nearly as structured as that unless I pay for a course. But I do look Mm -hmm. at that like there's some unstructured learning and there's structured learning. And I think depending on what you're trying to do, even playing could be learning. Do you guys ever like play around a little bit to learn? I encourage everybody to push all the buttons (laughs) and see what happens. I mean, really take when I was doing the scrapbooking thing, I would literally you know, on the weekends, I would play, I would play with it. I would just play, what if I did this and this? And what if I put this, you know, it was, there was no, it was totally free and open and not rigid. And, you know, that's one of the things that I like, it's almost like giving yourself homework, right? I'm going to like, so I'm going to give mm-hmm. myself like a framework to play in. And I think this would be helpful as podcast editors. Like I'm going to make some dummy audio and then i'm gonna see how crazy i can get with it like experimental art so yeah play push all the buttons well if we're not setting aside that time for structured learning how do you how often do you feel that you need to take that time to do any learning like what's going to prompt you to learn it aside from say a client having a problem like for me like i said it if i see that i'm I'm not moving fast enough or this particular edit's taking too long. I might look for a shortcut or or I hear something in the background that I just it's bugging me but it's not bothering my client as much. That's going to prompt me to look for something. What prompts you? So for me, I, I think cuz I can only answer for me of course. Mm-hmm. That's kind of a ridiculous mm-hmm. thing to say now that I think about it. <laughs> uh, but but for me, I think there's a couple of things. One would be if I encounter something that I've not encountered before that I want to see if I can fix it, or if mm-hmm. I encounter a new technique, I happen to hear about something and I just want to see if I can make it work, or if there's something that I want to be able to do in the future. So as an example, okay, I recently purchased a course, based something along the lines of YouTube for podcasters. The reason being that at some point I would like to start helping my clients take their podcasts and create some content for YouTube. And in mm-hmm. order to do that, I wanted to learn from somebody who had already been there. And so I bought that course. It was not expensive and I went through the course so that I can do that. But I also haven't applied it yet. And I know that the magic's really in going to do that. And so that's 
Like, I don't know where I free up the time to do that. I'll, I'll back off. What, what about the rest of you? So one thing that prompts me is comments from other people. So if I see somebody sit like in like the editor's club talking about something they can do in their DAW that I don't know how to do in Reaper, then just like well, trying to figure out how to do it in Reaper or or mm. whenever Waves has a sale on the plugin. And so now <laughs> <laughs> well, That's yeah. a good so now one. I want to play with the That's new plugin. That's a good one. I like that. <laughs> that, is. that is. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> Definitely. For me, a lot of times I will listen to a podcast and I'll be like, I'll listen to the sound or something in the sound and I'll be like, how did they do that? Right. Or I'll listen to like, and I, you know, that's kind of hard to articulate. I don't know if that's, is that hard to articulate? So I'll hear like, um, some sort of panning or some sort of like, you know, width or something there's something in the audio that makes me go i mm-hmm, want to know how mm-hmm. they did this right yeah and there's some sort of effect and i just want to yeah. know how they did it like it's just you know and i'm always curious about how other people do things right and and are they doing oh, it better yeah. than me yeah or faster than me right so and going right. back to what daniel right. said just like other editors hearing from um, talk, ed- other editors talking about what they do like if they're doing something i have that with audition too can audition do what this editor says hindenburg could do or reaper can do or whatever mm-hmm. no it's impossible well i reaper have can do aud- everything i have pushed audition <laughs> to its limits lately so <laughs> it's uh <laughs> oh, yeah, wait and- Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Helen just said that um, it's hard scheduling time for this. She's wanted to learn basic video editing, but just hasn't made the time. Yeah. Yeah. So go I, ahead, Daniel. I feel that one because I bought Tom Kelly's EQ course, and I think I'm two videos in mm. and haven't gotten into it. You're two more videos in than I am. <laughs> <laughs> and isn't that isn't that like six or eight hours? It's of, a lot. Yeah. Like it goes deep, yeah. right? And it wasn't like outrageously expensive, but also wasn't cheap. Yeah. Yeah. So there is that sweet spot, right? That you go, okay, this is the, there's no payoff here. I can't afford to invest in this. Either I don't have the cash or I don't see how it pays out versus this oh. doesn't hurt enough to really care, right? So like giving my email address for the podcast bundle that comes around twice a year and then everybody spams me for six weeks and then I'm done. Like those don't actually cost me enough to care where you go, this this is enough that I care, but not so much that I think that it's going to be a waste. Well, how about you, Carrie? I have a hard time with this because I care about everything. I want to know all the things. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I have stopped. Like if it's, you know, it some of it depends on how it's delivered. Right. If it's not going to be a learning style, like if I'm going to have to read a lot to get it not happening, it it just Mm -hmm. doesn't happen. Like I try to look for things that suit the way I learn best and I'm very visual and very hands on. So if you don't have those two components, it's going to be interesting, but I'm going to look for another way to get that information. And also, I don't want anybody to email me for six weeks. So I'm generally not going to give you my email <laughs> to sign up, you know, those bundles. And, and I've, I've like given out content yeah. in those butters. I learned but my lessons. Bundles. But, you know, I'm not going to email you, you know, regularly because, you know, I can only write so many newsletters anyway. And I don't want to be emailed essentially. So yeah, my threshold is really, it has to be, and I don't even know if this answers the question, but, but it needs to be in a way I know I'm going to learn and I'm going to be able to get through it. And I still might not, but I, I try not, I st- stop beating myself up about it because it's there. It'll be there later when I need it. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think so. <laughs> How about you, Daniel? So threshold, because like financially, like, I'm not going to invest in something because, like, I really want to take Chris Curran's, um, you know, the podcast engineering school, but it's just, like, more money than... It's kind of what you're talking about. Like, I don't see the ROI from going through this school. But then, like, I have... I want to say there's, like, another course I bought that I forgot about. So, like, I don't mind spending money. It's just, like, making the time to actually put into it while balancing everything else out. Well, that's why I feel like... If it's something that you want to learn and something that you think you will eventually need to learn and it's something you're willing to make that investment in, if as long as it doesn't expire, then Mm -hmm. you can do it. And, you know, I wouldn't recommend doing that with doing this with uh, podcast engineering school because that's more of a hands on. But like it'll be there later. 
right? So you have access yeah. to that information and it's all aggregated yeah. for you. There's no, that's the other benefit of, of paying for something is it's all aggregated. There's no like hunting and pecking on YouTube for just that one video that's going to give you the actual explanation. Mm hmm. And it just makes it much quicker. Yeah. And for me, it's like, I know enough EQ that like I built a business, <laughs> like I'm doing it. So like <laughs> we're going through bad. a full course. <laughs> it's like, it is like, am I going to improve my skills enough that my, my clients are going to notice? Like, that's the thing. It's like, I can master EQ, but it's like, how much is like, is that going to lay me more clients or not? Well, maybe some of it isn't just for your clients. Maybe it's mm -hmm. for for you because you'll know that you're doing better. And sometimes podcasting is really, it's a hobby and you put money into all hobbies, whether it's sports or video games, cooking and knitting, you know, the classic, classic hobbies. Um, I just feel like podcasting is a hobby for some people and even editing can be considered, you know, a hobby. You're just... You're making that little bit of extra money on the side now. For me, it started as a hobby, okay? But it it's grown into a business. And I do want it to be more substantial than what it is because I do want to quit my day job. I do want to do this full time. I want to be home every morning to see my children and tuck them in every night. And I don't get to do that with my day job. But I have more of a passion for editing. And if I were to to tweak those little things... It's it's for me, whether everyone else he hears it or not. And there are certain things that I do in, in the edits now where I'll ask my husband, hey, can you tell a difference in this? And he's right. like, nope, I yeah. can't. Not even a little bit. But it sounds better to me. And I know that I did a good job, whether my client can tell or or anybody else. You know, I just know that I did it and I did it for me. And I think maybe education isn't always about mm -hmm. everybody else. <laughs> you know, it's like bettering yourself I, at the end of the day. I feel yeah. that. Definitely. There's certainly, and, and there's a benefit to that confidence factor, right? It's not just that you're confident. You also then start approaching your sales conversations with more confidence, yeah. right? Because you go, yeah. mm -hmm. oh, wait, I know all of these other things that nobody else will even notice. And I know that mm -hmm. I can fix right. all of those too. Helen had an interesting comment. I want to kind of camp on that for a second because her, her comment about the threshold was that maybe it's not so much about the price and I'm summarizing, I'm not going to read it, but she was talking about how she did a free course. Uh, you didn't even have to do anything to apply, but she went through and did all of it because she knew it was going to be really beneficial. So maybe it's not just the money, it's also what you gain. So what do you guys like? Uh, I guess let's start with Daniel because otherwise I just asked the question to everybody. <laughs> Daniel, what do you think about that? Um, I know there's like the, I, I think I kind of relate to that because I learned basic video editing from, well, free to me. It was through Linda. Um, and I had like a free membership through my local library, you know, because there's that adage like you need to pay for something in order to like have an investment in it. Like if you get something for free, you're not going to like care about it. But I'm kind of with Helen, like if the been like if the payout at the end, like the knowledge is worth it, because especially like if it's a passion, like if you're like really into video editing or really into audio editing, a free course isn't is going to be just as beneficial as like spending a lot of money on a course. Mm -hmm. I think so. If we can talk about hobbies for a second, like. I look up old recipes from like the Middle Ages or the Tudor times and see how they cook things because I would love to be able to. So mm. I know an awful lot about cooking <laughs> like 500 years ago. And I could probably, you know, if you just put me in front of a fire right now <laughs> with Roast some squirrel. iron things. <laughs> I'm so intrigued by that. Right? I just want to talk about that um, now. <laughs> I do it, you know, and I, I'm such a nerd over it. I love it. And, you know, that's like when I retire, one of my things is I want to cook through history, mm. right? And yeah. I don't do, it doesn't gain me anything. I mean, and half the stuff I'd make probably would taste terrible. But it's the experience, right? Well, I mean, because mm -hmm. they don't like right. have... Yeah, there are no measurements. Medieval, it's yeah, right. like or not you know, medieval. Yeah, I know what you mean. Are the, the access to different yeah, spices lots and, of dried and different fruit foods and as a whole, <laughs> you know, which yeah. isn't my cup of tea. But still, like, I think that there is benefit <laughs> to learning things, regardless of whether you pay for it or not, and and just being curious about you know your job and and mm -hmm. the world that we're in and all that good stuff. So, yeah, just being curious. I like that. Yeah, it keeps you, it also keeps you in love with your job, I think. I think if we stayed doing the same thing over and over and not really expanding ourselves at all, we would just get burnt out. Yeah, totally. Have you guys ever heard of the term putty people? No. P U T T Y? No. 
being a multi-potentialite. Okay, so I heard about it on a TED Talk, and I'm going to be honest with you. I thought there was something wrong with me because I would jump from hobby to hobby to hobby or whatever to whatever, whatever. But it turned out I fall under a putty putty person, and basically what it is is I would learn one thing to the point where I was really good at it. I did not an expert, not a specialist, but I was good at it. And then I would be bored with it. And then I'd jump to the next thing and the next thing. Well, this is one of those passions where I have not learned everything. I just keep learning more and there, because more keeps developing. And as long as there's going to be more education and techniques and just different ways to do this, I'm going to keep learning and stay on track and still be passionate about it. And maybe that's what it is for me when it comes to to getting my education <laughs> units and, and learning. There's just so much that keeps changing and, and so many different facets yeah, and, to and it. And this is you a know? baby yeah. industry, really, or an adolescent now. So like, really we're not just learning as we go. We also have the ability to kind of influence and, and mold as yeah. we go the industry Mm -hmm. to however we need it to be. So I think that part also makes this a little bit special compared to anything else. Yeah. yeah. And, and I would add that even if we manage to master all of the tools, like if we could do all of the things, that doesn't mean that some of the hosts we work with wouldn't upgrade themselves and figure out new ways to give us challenges. <laughs> or there wouldn't be a new <laughs> right? like mm -hmm. Zoom that alternative to <laughs> work out the kings. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. You're right about that. Yeah. So uh, it, Zach has an interesting comment. Um, he said he came from yeah. a different path. He started as an audio engineer and was one for 20 years. And then he started his podcast. He's a baby podcaster. A year and six months ago, and then started seeking out people who might need his help with the editing, mixing, and mastering. And he, congratulations, Zach, landed three gigs in the last two months. That's yeah, awesome. Congrats. Yeah. So I'm always interested in that conversion from audio engineer to podcast Me editor too. because mm -hmm. it's not quite the same. And I think there's some things like I, I know mm -hmm. personally, I've had the audio engineers I've worked with, I've had to teach them how to do dialogue so uh, we ought to have zach on the show one of these days to talk about that That'd be so fun. there you go zach i've given you a job that is to <laughs> your job is to fill out the form at podcast editors mastermind.com slash be a guest and let us know that you'd like to be a guest that will and and the rest of you as well you have that opportunity that will invariably go to daniel's spam folder and every couple of weeks he'll clean that out <laughs> And we'll pull it in and we'll reach out to you. And if it's if it's the second Tuesday of the month and the sun is shining, then we'll we'll see what we can do. So, Zach, we'd love to hear from you and the rest of you as well. Now I'm going to stop off the promo. <laughs> Sorry, Kate. No, I was done. That's That's it. Segue. <laughs> so we, we've talked about continuing education, but I, I suspect that this could also go too far, right? If you're spending all of your time learning all of the time, then your business implodes. So, like, how do you know that it's enough but not too much? Like learning too much? Yeah. Like how, how do you know that you're not dedicating too much of your time to structured or unstructured learning as compared to just doing the work? I mean, part of it's if it's eating into like actually working on your business. Like if yeah. you spend mm -hmm. too much time like learning and not enough time doing. And like I think, wow. <laughs> I think some people... I'm sorry. I just oh. feel a little convicted right now. <laughs> no. <laughs> I feel like I spend so much time trying because like Carrie said earlier, are are other editors doing it better than me? Are they editing faster? Can they make it sound better than me? And then Brian's like, can you learn too much or can you be spending too much time learning? And Daniel's like, you know, maybe you're not spending enough time in your business. I, maybe that's me. Maybe our goal is to make sure that you walk out of here with no yeah. confidence. Yeah. By, yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> learn less, please. Yeah. No, I think that, you know, as long as it's not like nobody's yelling at you uh, um, or, or like upset with you. Like, I think that your family is a good indicator. If you're spending too much time on yeah. something, they will let you know, especially if you have an autistic child. He will, you know, no hesitation there. Mm. He will call you right. out on it immediately. So, I mean, it's definitely something, you know, you have these other like external indicators. But I would say also that if you have like not taken, like if you learn so much that you get confused, like I don't know if you've oh. ever, you've taken in That's a good. lot of yeah. information and, you, you know, all of a sudden it's all like, yeah. I don't know what to do anymore. Or you start to feel really bad mm -hmm. or stupid then maybe you're maybe just overwhelmed with right. all the mm -hmm. information yeah. so i think it's it's mm -hmm. learn apply 
you know, process, you know, and then repeat. Yeah. Then learn yeah. some more. And, and, and for me, it's it's not consistent, right? It's lumpy. I learn, <laughs> then I apply. <laughs> Learning is no, lumpy. I'm, I'm, I'm I serious. Love that. It's like <laughs> that should be the title of the episode. Well, sorry, in my day job, there's something called lumpy demand, which is when all of your customers order the same product at the same time, and then they don't order anything, and so you can't come up with a way mm. to predict what that demand profile looks like. Well, that's what mm. my learning looks like. I learn a bunch, okay. and then I go do this stuff, and then I go and learn a bunch, and so. Like I, I don't have like a hard and fast rule. I should, I should be, I sh should yeah. be learning consistently over time, all the time. But I don't. Right? I learn. Uh, I take a course and I apply it, and then I take a course and I apply it, and then I take another course and I get confused about the three courses I just finished. And like it, it goes like that. Um, but that's that's a very good insight, right? That when when you start getting confused, it's it might be time to back off. What if maybe we had more of like a structured learning schedule, like for, I'm going to quote the wrong hours because I have to go to the website and check it every time. Like for me, I need like 26 hours of whatever for the week, um, or not, I'm sorry, not the week, like 12 learning hours of say cardiac education for the year. And I need 40 hours altogether. What if we didn't have lumpy learning? We just know we had to have 40 hours of podcast education or not podcast, audio education for the year. And once we meet that goal, we feel good about ourselves. But if we wanted to go beyond that, then obviously that's on us. I mean, I feel like that's something Carrie should be in charge of, <laughs> that she should just tell everybody what to, what to do and do. then we can go um, do it. <laughs> I, I need 40 hours a, a month of telling people what to do. Yeah. I, you know, it depends, you know, because there aren't like, I mean, we aren't regulated or anything. And I know with the medical field, you, yeah, you, right, you have right, to right. get those CEUs. I think in every other field, it's just a smart thing to do to maybe not do it hourly, but by skill, right? So if, you know, yeah, yeah. like you could have EQ month, right? Or, you know, e a, a couple of months. Yeah. Like I'm going to learn EQ. And when I'm satisfied with that, yeah. and, and this is what I tell people, like learn one thing at a time, Um, you know, start with mm -hmm. EQ because it's such a foundational thing, right? And then go into compression or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you know, take it in small chunks and maybe not think it. And I don't like to think about things in terms of time because I'm not good with time. They'll tell you that. Um. <laughs> we won't say anything. It's scary. But, but do it in, in do it in a way that works for you. If that's time or if it's just like, uh, I'm going to dedicate, you know, now until whenever I feel like it to this task or to this learning. So maybe just establishing right. those small goals, right. say quarterly or just or just four goals for the year. I'm going to learn this, this and this and not even set like a time frame, you know, say like within weeks, you just right. know you want to hit these and that, goals. That's basically what I do is mm -hmm. like I will give myself these, you know, maybe not four. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I don't like to fail on goals. Um, so, right. I, you know, just, I, you know, I'm going to learn this. I'm going to learn this. I'm going to learn this. And that's, you know, you know, and you just do it however it comes to you, I guess. I'm all yeah, loosey goosey. Yeah. And I like so. If that works for you, because some people, like for me, if I do that, then I'm going to like push it off and push it off or something else. Like for me, I think it'd be more beneficial to like every week set aside like an hour a week to education as opposed to like, here are the four things I want to get done this year. Kind of by finding like what mm -hmm. works best for you. I feel like Brian's going to be different yeah. on that. Well, no, actually, I was going to say that I, I like where you were headed with that. And I'm wondering if maybe, I, I think this is how I think of it, honestly. So maybe, maybe you finally tapped into like the secret <laughs> of Brian's brain. And now I understand me a little bit. I tend to like to think of these as transformational. So I want to go from what I'm like or what I can do to something that I don't do well or something that I'm not yet like. And so I try to think of things based on an outcome that I'm hoping to achieve. And then typically I'll pick a different course and go off and do that because it was shinier and the, the web copy was better. But that's, that's the way I like to think that I would operate is go, okay, I want to be able to offer my clients um, copywriting, podcast management, and YouTube videos for their shows. So I will go and learn how to do those things. And those are then the courses that I would want to go. So I, I did go through Lauren, uh, like a third of Lauren Wrighton's course on podcast management. I went through a course on YouTube. Like I've done some of that stuff. And now I have a client that's sort of starting to edge into that. And so now I'm starting to practice that. But that didn't start with me sitting down and going, I want to dedicate two hours a week to continuing education. It said, mm -hmm. 
what do I want to be able to do? Because this is where I think the business is heading, or this is the way I think I want my business to head. Now, what yeah. do I have yeah, to do I'm to just get there? Kind of pile on right. to that, and, and just uh, just Uh-oh. in another way, like I will look at the you know podcast jobs and you know because i have a google alert to see what's out there and i i see these projects and i'd be like oh i'd love to be able to like work on that that sounds so interesting but i don't necessarily have the skills and so i'll be like well maybe that's something i ought to consider learning so that's another way those that that comes up for me is like fun projects that's you know mm-hmm. and i don't know how to do something yeah. i just you know it's like every time there's there's a job posting, you know, and I and I go look at the requirements and everything and and listed in that, I look what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? Oh, I can't do that or I'm not very good at that. And that's another thing I decide to focus on to to strengthen. The only issue is not all of my clients need that, so I can't always keep that skill sharpened. So I feel like that's where I fall back into always education always learning and relearning and relearning. And that's sometimes where having your own show or you could be a little bit more playful or or, uh, experimental can be helpful. I just have that for me is difficult. I have hard time balancing personal stuff with business. And for me, if I had working on that own, see, I started the podcast. I I recorded it, but I never (laughs) did the editing because I was editing other we clients. can't relate to that. You, you never have that problem with this show. <laughs> so I, I'd like to take what Carrie said and maybe just put a, a call out to those who are posting podcast jobs. If you want your editors to upskill before they start applying for jobs, put out good job descriptions that tell them what you're actually looking for so that when they're looking at those job descriptions, they can say, ooh, I can do this. I can do it. Like I can do all of these things. I can't do this thing. Not only will I, one, not waste your time by applying for a job that I wouldn't have known that I wasn't qualified for if you didn't tell me, right. but also- right. Let's just say that there's a 50-50 chance that everybody who looks at that goes, hey, I'm going to go learn how to do that thing or I'm going to figure out how to add that to my business. Like That's a win for everybody. So if you're putting up (laughs) job postings for podcast editors or podcast producers, let us know what you actually want. (laughs) Don't just say, I've got a biweekly show that's an hour long with two people. What are you going to charge me to edit it? Like, Let us know what what you're actually looking for. Uh, No, no, I think that's really, really accurate. And I think no matter what kind of podcast editor you are, you're going to run into that, right? You're going to run into the the vague job post where, and and then it turns into scope creep. So that's the other problem. Yes. So we're not going to talk about that right now. Mm -hmm. (laughs) No, I mean, so, you know, I've, I've got a couple people that do some editing for me. And that's one of the things I try to manage on their behalf is that to make sure that I'm never like that the scope is defined so that the the roles and the expectations are defined. If they want to go beyond that on their own volition, of course, they're allowed. But I try to make sure that I never expect something that wasn't part of that agreement. But that's also what I would like to see out of my clients. And that's a little bit more challenging because most of them don't know when yeah, they first start out that, what they actually want. That is, a, is an right. issue, which is another thing to like consider learning about is not just the audio skills, but those people skills. No, no, no people, no people skills. <laughs> a little bit, of, a little bit of psychology, or uh, you know, hang out with some kids for a while, and then you <laughs> you can apply that skill to your your business. I mean, it's it, you know, I learned a lot about people from babysitting and hanging out with kids because if you give them too many choices or you aren't clear and direct, it, it's chaos. Right. Mm -hmm. Wait, no, I didn't say you could have chocolate, like that entire chocolate cake, but you know, at at four o'clock before dinner, but the kids will do it if you're not (laughs) careful. So yeah, I'm just throwing that out there. Yeah. I think it's a good (laughs) point. Like one thing to keep in mind is not only continue education as far as audio work, like uh, your editing skills or audio engineering, um, but also just like business skills or keeping up with changes in podcasting. Oh, God, I was feeling so old because I think we were talking about like the Bitcoin thing in podcasting and I just I, I just can't get there. I, I just can't. Are you talking about the NFTs, um, that thing? No, what is it that's uh, I, I don't even know what it's called, but like the code you can put in where people can donate money. Dave Jackson mm-hmm. just posted about it somewhere. Like he's going to do a, a webinar or something on it. Um, how to get, you know, people donate Bitcoin to your show. I don't know. Can I ask a question? Uh, Daniel, what, what did you mean by changes in podcasting? Like, what, what were you talking about specifically with that? 
like how more media hosts are having like dynamic ad insertion. So it's kind of keeping up like who's doing what. The latest like Apple bug that's happening. The latest scandal with Spotify. <laughs> Anchors doing what, you know. Mm, okay. Yeah. Pod news for that okay. is helpful, but mm-hmm. or, that's yeah. pretty much it for me. We're if it's talking not on about pod the news. like a name sp- the art like namespace or whatever. Um, like I don't yes. understand that at all. Like it has the to do with the RSS tags, right? The namespace. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a and total when does nerd Lipson thing. Get it? I don't know. Or when does Captivate get it? Well, okay. that's up to them, right? So the the yeah. you ready to nerd out? No, <laughs> do it. But yes, the the <laughs> the the RSS feed is an XML file, which means extensible markup language, and what that means is that they can add other things to it. Right, so it's got a, a basic structure, and then they can add things. So when iTunes came out and they added their tags, the iTunes tags, those are markup within that XML file, and you put if you were handwriting the code, you'd put iTunes colon description or whatever, and then you put the thing and then you close your tag like it's HTML. Well, they're adding Mm -hmm. new tags, new metadata to that for things like donations and transcriptions and some other things. That's all kind of tied into that podcasting 2.0 and the podcastindex.org thing to go, hey, it's been long enough. Let's figure out a way to embed this stuff in the RSS feed rather than requiring people to go to your website for this or not being able to do that. Um, The challenge is that because it's an open medium, first you have to get enough people to all sit around and sing songs and hold hands and go, yeah, this is what we want to do. Then you have to get the media hosts to support it, to, to put these things in the feed and you have to get the podcast apps to recognize those things that you stuck in the feed. But because sometimes it ends up being a little bit of a pissing match, if Blueberry puts out a thing, Captivate might not recognize it because it's their branded thing. So they try to do it all together. But the challenge is you still have to get Apple and Spotify and now probably Google Podcasts to recognize it before it really gets any traction across the broader space. So it's like this whole thing where you've, you're basically trying to create a three-sided market where listeners want it, podcasters want it, media hosts support it, let apps support it, and then the podcasters actually do the thing, right? So that everybody can get the thing. So it's really so a it's challenging thing happen. to do. I hope it does. I think, no, no. go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> My mind is blown. It's like, whoa. Well put. So like wow. the transcriptions thing, I think that needs to happen because it is an audio only medium. And I think that we've used the excuse long enough. It's an audio experience. We need to be able to provide something for those who can't or prefer not to listen. Right. And in my mind, having that delivered as a time-based file within the podcast app so that they can read along or however yeah. the, the app support it. Oh, yeah. Instead of saying, go download my PDF transcript and try and read it on your little mm-hmm. phone with yeah. a little 10-point font that the genius... <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to back off. <laughs> right. Let's create a, a reasonably good experience, the best that we can for everybody. And that's what that particular tag is about. Then like the donations tag, that's about, hey, how can we give some money back to the, the creator with ha- without having to go through Patreon or some specific platform? Let's, let's put something where whatever app they're using, as long as the app supports it, they can click a button, give some money and off it goes. Like, I think that should happen. I'd also love to see a way where that money is split between the app developer and the person who created the podcast. So say you give me $3 from on Overcast and Overcast gets 50 cents, right? To help them continue to fund that mm-hmm. app. I'd love mm-hmm. to see that happen. Don't know how that happens. So You've got I don't know. strong feelings about those. Okay. Yeah. I do. Well, be- because because if the apps are only supported when people pay money to buy the apps, then as we have a couple of stronger players, the the lesser players, let's say Pocket Casts or somebody like that, doesn't have as much incentive to keep developing it because people aren't buying their app and they don't get anything from the usage even though they're paying for bandwidth, right? Every time their user agent pings my RSS feed, they're paying for bandwidth. Every time you download, there's a ping that goes through. Like it's not a lot because most of the bandwidth is coming through the RSS feed and that download. But yeah, there's money involved. It's not free and they need a piece of the pie. And I I think that needs to happen. I agree. This is not at all about continuing no, learning anymore. No, but it was it? interesting. I feel like I learned stuff. So congratulations, yeah. everybody. You oh, just yeah. learned about the podcast namespace and why it's important. You have engaged us <laughs> and educated and, us. <laughs> I have been inspired <laughs> and encouraged. <laughs> yeah. I got one more Maybe E. We're coming to Brian's TED Talk. W- which E would that be? Enlightened. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know if I can yeah, do that. Well, you can't have everything. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I feel like I kind of steered us off. Does somebody want to get us back on course here? So 
when you're looking at courses, like, how do you determine what worthy? It's like, obviously, you know, Tom Kelly, we all know and love whatever he puts out, you know, is going to be top tier. But it, how do you determine, like, is this a course worth taking versus like, is this somebody who's just trying to make money by putting out a course who probably shouldn't be? Well, if I know your name, that's a good place so a good, to yeah. start. It's like those sponsored Facebook ads you see for courses and they talk about podcasting mm-hmm. or something. And I'm like, I, but I don't know who you are. I've never heard of you. I've been doing this yeah. for a long time. Who are you? If you're talking into the end of mm-hmm. a Blue Yeti in a room with like foam all over the walls and your microphone is turned around backwards to boot and like, I'm out. But if Steve Stewart says, hey, because I know Steve, I, I trust his recommendations. Or if Carrie says, hey, you need to check out this person's course, that means a lot to me because I don't have time to rec- you know, I don't have time to research every person person that has a 27 or 37 or $97 course. I just don't have time for that. Well, you all had to start somewhere. Carrie, you haven't always been known. Steve hasn't always been known. I'm not known, but you don't know what I know. And that's going to go back into the descriptions of what is in that actual course. So for me, I would have to look at the actual description. I would have to talk with the creator. You know, what's different about yours? And I'm creating my course now and I'm taking other courses to compare it with with well, mine. You you're know, cr- You're creating a course? Yes, I've been doing this for 15 years and I think there's there are holes in other people's, like things that other people may not have in theirs and then another one may not have in theirs. And I'm just trying to, As a lifelong learner, I'm trying to concentrate or condense what I've learned into into my own thing. I don't even know if I would be confident enough to sell it, but I would have that course to give to somebody else or, you know, this is what I have. This is what I've learned. You don't have to buy it, but here it is. I think you should totally sell it. And I think you you can, you know. You can beta test it for sure and get feedback on it. But I, I think that's a good point. Like we don't necessarily like nobody knew who I was when I, you know, years ago. And some people still might not. I, and that's where also like the like the course description and testimonials. Like what are other students saying? And if I can I ask the creator, the course creator to like give me a, a reference from another student, like I would you know, that's something I would be totally mm-hmm. happy and I would have students that would be totally happy to do that. And, 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 you know, if I don't know the creator, I'll also Google them. Like what what people are saying mm-hmm. on like Reddit is telling mm-hmm. <laughs> or in Facebook. Yeah, a little bit of research, research. you know. <laughs> uh, but, you know, yeah. early on, I got burned on a lot of courses. Like they weren't very good. They weren't teaching mm-hmm. me the right things. And mm-hmm. that's, you know, that also helped me identify like, okay, well, what makes a good course? That kind of thing. You know. So even though right. the courses I took early on weren't good, I still actually learned something from that. So I think mm-hmm. that everything is a learning experience, right? So mm-hmm. even mm-hmm. when the learning experience isn't positive. So, all right, I'm done talking. How about software. Like we've talked a lot about learning things like courses and that kind of stuff. How often do you try out new software to see how it does as an intentional learning thing? Well, you know what, Brian, I was going to bring that up earlier. Sweet. (laughs) I mean, it's, I was going to mention like the scheduling apps and this is a trouble word. Yeah. Calendly. Yes. Okay. So I don't know much about that. Um, I didn't know much about Squadcast. And then there's another one. Yeah. There's that one. See, it's you. Trello. Trello. Trello uh, is another one. Mm-hmm. ClickUp. Yes. There's one. Love so me some ClickUp. That would, <laughs> th- those are things that are new. Okay. But they seem like they're, there's so much information. It's so good. That would be something that I would set aside time specifically to learn that because I just feel like it would be a really useful tool. And if you didn't set aside time for that particular software, you're wasting your own time trying to use it when you don't know how to use yeah. it. It, it can yeah. definitely get confusing. To counter mm-hmm. that, keeping yourself in check to not dive into a new software you don't need. Because I use Airtable for my project management to keep track of everything. But it's not exactly how I want it to work. Like I, there are a few things that I would tweak if I could. So I've tried out like five or six other tools trying to find like that perfect solution and wasted so much time and money on that rather than just like sticking with what works and putting my energy elsewhere. There's a, there's a balance there. And also like if you are proficient in your DAW, there's not a whole lot of benefit in learning other DAWs as well. So I, I actually try new DAWs from time to time. Really? When something comes out, because I, I keep going back to Hindenburg. Like, I, I don't think they're in, in danger of losing me, but like, I have a copy of Pro Tools first and I've tried to use it. Their shuffle delete works okay. I don't 
really like Pro Tools that much, but I've tried it. I picked up Harrison Mixbus because I really miss being able to have a, a channel strip in front of me that actually is a channel strip rather than a series of plugins. And then also I learned a lot about what some, let's, let's just say that one particular company doesn't understand about podcasting standards because they have like this podcasting preset and it's got each voice is panned 25% to one side, the compression's off the charts. <laughs> like. <laughs> Well, but but I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't said, hey, I'll drop 30 bucks and try this DAW. Like, I probably won't use it, but I like the idea. So let's let's give it a shot. I won't drop, you know, 30 bucks a month on Audition because I it's not that I don't care about Audition, but I'm familiar enough to know what it can do. And I'm also familiar enough to know that I don't really want that for my workflow. Um, do, do any of you ever try a new DAW? Like just for grins and giggles? Uh, not for grins and giggles, always for a specific purpose. And then I'm like, you know what? I'm much faster in audition. There are things about other dogs that I appreciate, right? I, you know, especially doing things like it, like narrative work. Those clips in Hindenburg would be really useful in audition. Like I just so here's what I want to learn new dogs for is to tell Adobe what I need in audition. <laughs> <laughs> so if go. anybody from <laughs> Adobe is listening, we can talk. <laughs> mm-hmm. I like that answer. That's spot on, Carrie. I like that. I agree with you. Yeah. And then like in terms of other tech, I have this rule that if I see somebody using something cool, I don't jump on it immediately because I like it's shiny object syndrome. I will get so distracted so fast mm-hmm. and it it actually makes me really unproductive. So I take my time when it comes to switching to something new or and I'm still like, I started setting up Sweet Dash like a long time ago and I never finished because, um, which is a, it's a like CRM and productivity tool and client portal. All this, it's got all the bells and whistles. And I, I just, I stopped in the middle of it and not because there's anything wrong with it, but because I tend to like to keep things simple right and, and then other things come up and i got distracted so anyway i get distracted easily so i can't i can't stop for everything and you know but i will happily let anybody talk about it like you know for just busters we do I, and what i sh- wanted to tell you heather is in just busters we have the click up and the dubsado and all those um webinars in there for you to learn I have to schedule time. (laughs) But they're there. They're there. All right. I'm done talking again because I don't know where I'm going. (laughs) So is is there anything that we missed before we bring it? Well, Daniel, you were going to say something. Well, just for anybody out there, suggestions on where to find quality courses or information. Pod news to keep up with podcasting. Mm -hmm. Uh, Brittany Felix, I think, has a kind of like newsletter thing that she puts out and then the podcast editors academy has a ton of webinars and courses and discounts and deals and yeah that's a great place i think now and yeah it's that's a great place to go to get courses too because steve and mark curate those Mm -hmm. it's not just any old fool's course that gets in there but and and helen king apparently is teaching uh young Mm. people how to podcast yes uh, which is totally cool and and, you know and so hopefully this has helped her think about, you know, learning and, and what to include and what's useful. That's hard on, on the course creator side is, is mm-hmm. you know, being strategic about what you present because you can overwhelm mm-hmm. people and they will learn nothing. Right. That, that right. was something as a creator I and, and a teacher I've had to learn myself. And it's hard for me sometimes to pull back. But are you concerned maybe you might between like not have the balance of uh, let's see, too much? Versus yeah, too it's hard. It, it's is, hard is to that... figure out what is just yeah. enough, right? And I think that becomes yeah, yeah, um, yeah. really important. Like you can't. That's why. That's why there's not one like course that fits all. There's not one teacher that fits all. There's right. not one like if I taught a dish audition, I can't just teach like everything I do in audition, right? Because it's where people start from and what gaps need to be filled. And I, I just no. I don't mean to talk over you, but I have to say this. Okay, I wasn't trying to be ugly no, when I no, said no. there's holes I in totally other people's that. courses. It's just it's like you're saying, you know, it's not a one size fits all. It's just when I when I know something and I see that it's missing, I just put, tuck that away. You know, that's not in there. Let me put it in this course. But it's just that balance right. of what's too right. much, 
versus what's too little. So I just no, 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 no. I mean, I get it, and that's why I said like get get that (laughs) feedback. You know, test it and get that feedback from your first round of students because you know those are the people. Mm -hmm. The first of all, excited for your course, and they'll let you know right if something doesn't work for them. Mm There, they'll be very you know, and and Mm -hmm. sometimes when you do a live workshop, they'll let you know, which is helpful. I mean, it's kind of like daunting in the moment but that it's helpful because it helps you refine and that's all right like learning is anyway is just refining and doing things a little bit better the next time so yeah yeah right. um, as, as we bring this to a close we do have our pod decks question of the day so for those of you watching live we would love to see your answers in the comments if you're listening later on the replay in the comments or uh episode notes the question for today is what's your most prized podcast possession and I will go first because even though Heather picked the number that gave us this card, I read the card. So it's my responsibility to go first. And I don't think I can choose one. For me, it's a tie because when I think about the two things that I don't think I could function without, one is Hindenburg and the other is Isotope RX-8. Like between the two of those, my entire production process would probably break down or I would have to get all new clients. So off to you, Daniel. Well, if I get to choose two, I would say like from practically speaking... (laughs) Only oh, me. Okay. Only me. Okay. I read like, the card. <laughs> practically speaking, it is Reaper. Not only is it because like it's the key to like my entire business, but also through my Facebook group, through my web uh, YouTube channel, it's opened up a lot of doors and just kind of a lot of opportunity and fun experience. And no more superficial would be my Sure MV7 because it's like the first. Nice. Really nice mic. And I just, I love it. Carrie? Okay. Carrie? I'm going to go away low tech, guys. Oh, uh, flamingos. Well, it's the notebooks. So mm-hmm. I can keep my mm-hmm. life, you know, organized. Um, because without these notebooks, and I have a ton of them, and it's all kind of the same style, I would probably have forgotten to show up today, you know, or look at my phone or, you know, because I don't always have Facebook on. So really, it, it, um, or get my work done. So yeah, really low tech, but it, it really is just um, mm-hmm. my notebooks to keep me straight. How about you, Heather? I would say notebooks and my pen and my paper, but I just need that for my life in general. Since we're choosing two, I'm going to do hardware and software. I like Hindenburg. That's my dog of choice. But I could not do any of this without my laptop. Nice. It goes everywhere with me. I can't edit without it. I can't. I, I need my dog and I need my, need my laptop. I mean, I have the speakers in here. I have a microphone. I have a camera. I've got my, my mouse pad. So everything I need is right here. And if anything happens to this baby, I'm going to be lost. <laughs> so that was a tough, tough one for me, but it's definitely, definitely the laptop. Nice. Daniel, did you want to hit the comments? Uh, Helen King says, D Reverb and RX and also Descript has been great for me. Yeah. So I've, I've used Descript a little bit. D Reverb yeah. is definitely one of the yeah. go-to. And if I had to pick a second one, it would be the RX Advance. But um, Descript and I have a love-hate relationship right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I think... It, it loves your money and you hate um, using it. Something like that. <laughs> yeah. It, it it does definitely hates audition. I will say that. So, yeah. It, it just makes audition so laggy. Mm, but yes. Yeah. Anyway. Well, this, is, this has been great. Uh, Heather, thanks for, for coming on. We did talk about being a guest, but I don't know. Carrie, do you want to tell everybody how to be a guest again in I case guess they missed I will. the middle? So go to podcasteditorsmastermind.com slash be a guest. Fill out the little form and eventually Daniel will check the email that the form goes to and we will be in touch. And uh, I think that we have uh, another recording coming up. When, when's our next recording? It's going to be next week. We had a little scheduling issue. And by that, I mean, we all were unprepared and we didn't want to put out. Uh, <laughs> we it felt it, it felt it wasn't fair to bring on a guest that we weren't prepared for and just kind of put out a bogus episode. So rearrange the schedule a little bit. Heather was gracious enough to come on a week early. Uh, but next week we have Stevie Kent coming on to talk about making the transition to podcast editing full time. So that is going to be a fun one. Ooh, nice. Yeah. yeah. I want to yeah. hear that one. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'm going to. Uh, now, I was going to say, um, you shouldn't have said we were unprepared. I had come back from traveling. That's a good excuse. So yeah, it was my Carrie fault. Carrie had an excuse. I was unprepared. Okay. 
I didn't know what we were going to talk about either, but we should probably leave this before we just like throw out all of our dirty laundry. So I'm Brian. You can find me at toptieraudio.com or on the social media sites at Top Tier Audio. I'm Daniel Abendroth. You can find me at rothmedia.audio. And if you're interested in Reaper, check out reaperforpodcasting.com. I'm Carrie Caulfield. Eric, you can find me at yayapodcasting.com or on Instagram at Carrie Eric. And sometimes on Twitter, but I'm not going to tell you where to find me there. <laughs> <laughs> and our guest today was Heather. You can find her at Ironed Out Media, where she does edit. So if you're looking for an editor, go check it out, ironedoutmedia.com or Instagram at Ironed Out Media. Heather, thanks for being here. And bye, See ya. everybody. Thanks for having me. Bye, guys. Uh, um, so, how much is that? Um, I, um, uh, um, 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 uh, uh, so, um, uh, 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 u